So let us go ahead and turn in our Bibles, Ephesians 4, 1 to, 6, 1 to 16. And while you're turning there, I'm just going to draw a brief outline that gives you the big idea of the structure, uh, uh, the structure for Ephesians. So if we're looking at the, the structure for Ephesians, uh, Ephesians 1 to 3, this is theology. In Ephesians 4 to 6, we have application. The foundation is, is Ephesians 1 to 3, the theology. And then 4 to 6 is its application in the church. So what we could say here is it's in the church. And this, of course, includes the family, the individual, and in, and in society. So this is the this is the big this is like the big the big structure of Ephesians. So in Ephesians one to three, so much of the time has been spent on what is knowledge that we should know, and then four to six is how can we apply that knowing in the church. All right, let's go ahead and let's read Ephesians four one to sixteen. Therefore I. A prisoner of the Lord Jesus, a prisoner of the Lord, urged you to walk worthy of the calling which you were called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, and eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Because there is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that comes from your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, even the Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of, get, of the gift of Christ. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives. He gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean, but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God the mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Why? So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, by speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ from whom the whole body being joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When it is working, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Wow. We've studied this before, right? I think we studied this in uh, the I-Team curriculum previously. And so maybe if you've already had those notes, you can review them. But we, we are going to do it again because most of us have not uh, I, I should say some of us were not there. And on top of that, I'm learning stuff new. So actually, uh, um, I think this is very beneficial for all of us. And if I'm learning new things and really picking up with new insights, and I, and I, in many ways, I'm seeing it in a new light, having studied Ephesians 1 to 3, this type of, of review will be, I think it will be new to all of us. It, it won't be old, old. So let's look here now. I'll just begin working through the text. I'll make some highlights and I can ask some questions. Looking at verse one, there is this massive therefore, right? So this is this is coming from before we, we, we look at anything in, in 4, 1 to 16. This is coming from Ephesians 1 to 3. So we could say in view of this theology that Paul has taught, 
we could just say here theological truths. Therefore, so this is moving from theology to practical. Now, it is really interesting that Paul repeats. Paul is the one speaking, and he repeats this description here. What did we say prior about this description? During the verse, uh, chapter 1, introduce, when Paul introduced himself. Yeah, so there's another place where we discuss where, yes, but he doesn't describe himself as a prisoner to the Lord. He describes it later, I believe, in chapter 3. Does, does anyone remember what we had said about that? They recognize uh, God's sovereignty. Yes, excellent. Who was, was that Larry? Excellent. This is a reference to, excellent point, Larry. This is a, a reference to God's sovereignty, that God is in fact in control of his situation and all of our situations. If God is in control, Paul's situation, Cigarado, it's he's in control of, of our situation. But this is specifically God as Christ, the Lord throughout, throughout God, the father is the first person of the Trinity is referred to the father throughout in uh, the reference to Lord. It's always referring to, to Jesus Christ throughout the, 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 the epistle. Excellent point. Look at the, the, what, what is another word that we could use for urge? Maybe you can look it up in your Bible, in your Bible. What's another word? So Paul is urging them to do something. No, that, so this is good. So this is encourage. That's a, that's a possible translation. Um, uh, you had said this is a command, and that's also good. What was, someone else said something. Who else mentioned something? I'm trying implore, to implore. Implore. Okay, implore. that's good, Claudio. Any other word that we could use here? There is this other word that, that, that we often use called exhort. Beseech. Beseech. Okay, yeah. Exhort or beseech. Excellent. And so I do think there is an accent on, on, on this sense. Of course, these other words are conveyed in here. Okay, but I think the fundamental word that really gets at what Paul is saying here, because it's not just like trying to convince them, it's more than that. It's, it's an exhortation. And so Paul is exhorting the Ephesian believers. So this is the object of the one who's receiving this exhortation. And the exhortation is, look at this, it's to walk worthy of the calling to which you were called. So this is the object action that they are being called to. To walk. And this manner, this idea, this is manner here. Now, how had they walked previously? I want, I want you to think about this. So this is a question. How have they previously walked in the, in the previous context? Give me, give me some words as to how they had previously walked. They are uh, rebellious. So oh, oh. Yeah. Okay. So, 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 give me a reference, and I want I want you to read. So, so that's really good. Where, where, where are you getting that from, uh, Larry, and also Danny? Yeah, Ephesians two one. They were following the course of the world, Satan, and desires of the flesh. Is this not correct? In chapter two, we had said, we're focusing on content. Don't worry right now about application. We need you to understand these truths. That's the primary focus of Ephesians one to three. What truths do you need to know? You need to, set, you need to, to saturate them into your minds, into your heart. You need to receive them. Now we're getting practical, okay? So I said the commands are going to come. The commands are going to come. And, and this is the first. He goes right to their old lifestyle and says, says, now that you are in Christ, I, as a prisoner of the Lord, command you to walk in a manner that is worthy of your calling. This is coming back to 
in one sense, salvation is completely, a, a, I shouldn't say one sense. Fundamentally, salvation is, is, is completely a free gift. But we are in salvation, according to chapter two, we are created for good works. Correct? So this is, in, you can never say, oh, it's a tit for tat. Okay? It's, it, it's not a tit for tat. Maybe there's an appearance of a tit for tat. But, but the reality is, is that we have been created anew, and now we have to walk in agreement with that new creation. We, we have to walk in the new creation by which we have been created to, or, or the calling by which we've been called. So Ephesians 2.10. Now look at this here. He is going to get very specific. So we're, we are to have this new lifestyle. So we could say here, big takeaway. Let's just, let's just use a, a parallel word here. We can say lifestyle. This is a, a new lifestyle. That's a big idea here, okay? Let me be clear. I am not saying that we don't disciple. I, I don't want to be misunderstood before I go into this statement, okay? I'm not saying we don't disciple. I'm not saying that we don't preach the gospel, share the gospel with, 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 with other people in our lives. But notice the fundamental description. These are what's going to transpire here is we're going to have all of these manners. Okay, and what is so interesting is there is no reference to, 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 to making all these disciples. There's no reference to, 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 to sharing the gospel. I'm not saying that's not part of our lifestyle, okay? But what I am saying is fundamentally, what is most fundamental in walking in a, ma in a manner that is worthy of the calling to which we've been called? Fundamentally, what is, what's in Paul's mind? Humility. <laughs> Walking in humility. So someone who is, someone who is, 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 you see a Christian or even maybe yourself, I have to do the big, I have to do the big, the heavy lifting for God, but they're not walking in humility. They are not walking in a manner that's worthy of their calling. Gentleness. <laughs> My goodness. Gentleness. Someone who does not walk in gentleness. I don't care how many people they've won to the Lord. I don't care how big their church is. I don't care how great their job is. They are not walking in a manner that is worthy of their calling. Patience. Brothers and sisters, are these descriptions, are they exalted in our churches? Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> there was a time. There was a time. It's, I mean, this is this, this is not a, a punch in the face to us. I don't know what is. Because even for me, I'm guilty of this. You, you think you're doing the big work of God, and you don't have time for your children. You don't have time for your wife. They got to get with the program. But this is what it means fundamentally to walk in line with our, our calling. Look at this. Bearing with one another in love. <laughs> I mean, this is... If ever, if ever, we were confused on what is the most fundamental practice of a Christian, these, these descriptions are, 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 are not exalted in most churches, in most leaders. We're all guilty of this. Look at this, number five. Eager to maintain the unity of the faith. I'm sorry, the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So there's several, there's several words here. I'm going to highlight them, and I want you to tell me where you've seen this before in the text. In, in, so we have unity, we have spirit, we have peace. What previous passage have we discussed that really brings all of these into view? I want, I want you to give me a, a set of pa a passage from earlier in Ephesians. Ephesians 2.18. Yeah. Ephesians 2. Let's just do this. 11 to 22. Accented on verse 18, right? This is describing uh, Jesus being our peace, right? And, and in that context, it's Jew and Gentile. 
Jew and Gentile. We are all Gentiles, right? We're all Gentiles. So our practical is going to be slightly different. So when we get to the reflection section, I want you to be thinking about that, okay? I want you to be thinking about how this plays out in our context, in a context in Takloban, in a context in Manila, in a context in, in Cebu, so, um, or in Samar. This is gonna look slightly different for us, okay? So this is the, the big idea. If we can say here, this is the command. I liked what, uh, I, I liked what Danny said. This is the command, okay? And then if you can imagine here, this is the, the manner of how to carry that out. I hope you can imagine how your, your sermon is coming together if you're preaching this. <laughs> Verse four, there is one body, one spirit. Let's, let's ask then a question. What is the relationship between here and here? What do you think? What's a word that we could use to describe here? If there's a command here, and then there is this idea of unity, spirit, and peace, and then there's a statement. This is a, this is a state, a declaration. There is one body and one spirit. What's that relationship? I'm asking here, what is the relationship between the two? This idea of, I'm just going to put this in, 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 in small. So we have the possibility this is a source. Okay, good. We're, we're close. You're, you're very close. What's another relationship word? What's another relationship word besides source? There is one body, one spirit. How would that relate to this command to walk in, uh, eager to maintain the unity and this, and, and, uh, of the spirit and the body of peace? What's another word that we can use? Okay, so union is, so union is, let's write this down here. Union is, this is the reality, okay? But so we're looking, so let's just, I'm going to write this out here. Okay, so let's just do one more thing here. So this is, this is a declaration, correct? This is a declaration. There is one body, one spirit, right? So my question is, what is the relationship between these two? There's a command and a declaration. What is that relationship? Source is close, but it's not exact. Could we not say that this is the, the basis or instead of source, the ground, the ground for unity in the spirit is the fact that there's one body and one spirit. Does that make sense? Is everyone tracking there with me? Let's further <laughs> see where we go with this. So there's, there is uh, one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord one faith, one baptism, one God. So structurally speaking, Paul is emphasizing unity has to be a primary description in the body of Christ because, it's, because God is a God of unity. I'm going to add a prefix to that, Jesus. We are co-partakers. And, we, and we've seen that. And then even, even with one God. So people perhaps would use this to refer that it's only God the Father and then the Spirit and Jesus are not. Right? They could, they could try to use that. But the, the point of one God, we agree with that. Right? So we believe in one God, three persons. So there's, there's, they, they would also refer to it as triunity, okay? And so, and the reason why we can clearly say that is that if Paul, if Paul was wanting to put a distinction between Jesus and also the spirit with reference to God, what he would not include is this, this description here, right? So we have over all, through all in all. Well, how is God in all? The spirit. <laughs> how does God maintain everything? Through Jesus. <laughs> how is he overall? He's the father. So there is even this Trinitarian concept in declaring 
this is coming back to one God description. And you also have that in, you have that also here with the one spirit. And then also the one Lord, this is referring to, to Christ. And it's the Christ, and it's the, the Old Testament, the Old Testament Lord. So Christ fulfills the Old Testament Lord function. So God is the Father, and Jesus Christ is our Lord, the King of the universe, the ruler of the universe. So you, you, you can't escape the Trinitarian, it's 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 just saturated with Trinitarian concepts. And all of these, so we can we can speak of. Practically speaking, let's write this out here now. Practically speaking, the basis for the call to have unity is number one, God, union with Christ, the church. There's one salvation. <laughs> So when we call people, when we call people to unity in our church context, we are calling people on the basis of the unity in the Trinitarian God. We are calling it on the basis of our union with Christ. We are all brought into one with Christ. We are calling it into the, the makeup, the structure of the church. The church is one body. There is not Jew or Gentile. That's why it was so offensive in Galatians. When the Jews were separating from the Gentiles, it, it was anathema. Paul's like, you've destroyed the gospel. The whole point of the gospel is it's brought different people into one, and now you're, you're, you're building up the wall of hostility again. And in our salvation, there's only one salvation by faith. Let me be clear. We're going to see later in this context that we are to speak the truth in love. So this is this is in the context of this is in the context of let's add a caveat here. So this is not to say that we we seek unity above truth, above God's law, above the gospel, or above God's revelation. It's in this context. So 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 the time that we would not want to to be unified is if there is, for example, someone is preaching another gospel, right? So, so someone's preaching another gospel, Paul is saying, it's okay, unity above all else. He's like, no, they're cursed. Americans are very good at causing division because we're very strong-willed, right? Everyone's experienced that. Um, so we struggle with, with being unified because we really want to, to, to declare truth. Filipinos tend to struggle with focusing on being too unified and ignoring the, the false doctrine. So what I'm trying to get at is each context has its own issues. Now, to be fair, there's also Americans that are very unifying. They don't ever want to, to separate that, you know, even people living in sin, it's okay. We accept their sin. So it's not, it's not a, a catch-all, but there is those stereotypes. I, I think that Filipinos are, are much more inclined to be unified the relationship is so important right even above truth in america it's like truth is so important and they're not speaking it in love they're you know they're you know but here the emphasis is upon unity the emphasis is upon unity uh, i'll just review one more time okay so now that it's clear let's just review one more time so what i was trying to say was that paul is calling us to to unity right and anyone who has been in the church it's like, how can this be? How, you know, we're always fighting. There's always arguments. This seems like an impossible task. It seems as if an impossible task. And what I was bringing out here was that in Ephesians 2, in Ephesians 2, uh, 1 to 10, Paul declares that we have been saved by grace alone. And we would all agree, yes, salvation is by grace. But then we think of sanctification as by our own effort. Now, let me be clear. We do need to grow in grace and we do need to do uh, various things uh, to grow in our sanctification. But fundamentally, what is behind our growth 
is still grace. It's still grace. It's, it's not that we now are on our own to do our own thing. That's that we are now being propelled by grace. And so my emphasis here is not only do we have grace in salvation, but we also have grace in sanctification. And so that's what is being declared here. The, the actor here is, in fact, God the Father. He is the one that is giving us grace. And it's in agreement with the measure of the gift of Christ. Now, how do we translate this word, this phrase, gift of christ i i looked i've researched this i've gone back and forth at the end of the day i am very comfortable with seeing two senses here some people would say tim you can't have both that's exegetically uh, a mistake i i relish in it number one uh god gives christ so the measure of of christ's gift includes uh christ himself so God gives Christ to us. He gives Christ to us in union with him. He's our leader. He's, he's our head. But then also Christ gives gifts. And we're going to see later in this context, Christ meeting out gifts for the benefit of his body. Okay, so I, I you know, people will typically choose one or the other. I think in this sense, you can have both. Christ is the gift, and he also gives gifts. And, and, and both are true, and I think both are present in the context of Ephesians. This here, uh, therefore, it says, he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. And so this is a reference to, uh, this is a, revela- a reference to Christ giving gifts. The quotation is from Psalm 68. So right here we have a, This is a OT citation, Psalm 68, 18. Now, there's issues here, okay? There's issues with this citation. If you look at the original context, it's it's debated, okay? So I don't want us to, that, that is for like Ephesians, interpreting Ephesians level two, okay? We would discuss that if we were doing a Greek course. He ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. So this is the act of, of Christ giving gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? That he also descended into the lower regions, the earth. He who has descended is the one who has ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. So. This is greatly debated, this, these two passages of scripture. For our purposes here, I don't want to focus on this. If, if there is a huge need for us that you want to discuss this, we can create a workshop and we can discuss this and go, and go into the original context and discuss the various issues. There's also, um, there's also debate here concerning, concerning uh, issues concerning um, uh, hell. Did, did Christ go to hell? That, that, that's just beyond the scope of this class. Um, I know we were talking about theology, but just because we just don't have the time to discuss everything, if you want, post a comment in the Facebook group, and we can we can have a special uh, workshop to discuss this. But what I want us to focus upon is that is the is the is the work of Christ. So the one who has descended. So this we're looking at here the description of Christ. He is the one who has descended, and he has also ascended. So this is description one, description two. This is his humili- humility, humiliation, and this is his exaltation. And the purpose for him doing this, the one who descended is also the one who ascended, okay? The purpose is so that he might fill all things. And so we talked about what fill means, right? We talked about this before. Filling has the idea of his presence, his rule, his guidance. We could say guidance as well. So he is filling all things. He is present in all things. He's ruling over all things. And he's guiding us. So even looking at Christ as an example, 
we follow this path. We are, we are to live in humility, and then one day we will be exalted. And so there is, this, there is this path that we are following. And so then Christ also gives to help the church. He gave five offices, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. Now, the whole debate here is concerning, are all of these offices still continuing today? Let's put that aside for a moment and let's just focus on, on these different aspects, okay? Um, apostles are leading the church and they are giving revelation, right? Revelation from from Christ, we would agree with that. And, and the example of this would be Paul. Paul is the example. He's leading the church and he's giving revelation, he's teaching, okay? Prophets are declaring the word of God and they also giving revelation. Evangelists, this is literally proclaimers of the gospel. Is evangelist in this context inside or outside the church? Let me ask the question. Inside or outside the church, evangelist? In this context, though, Viva, this is inside. Everyone see that? Inside. So we often think of an evangelist as just someone who is going out to evangelize unbelievers. But the evangelist here is to equip the saints. So this is this is the, the benefit is in the church. Proclaiming the gospel to believers. Everyone sees that, right? Everyone sees that. All five of these are, are, are for, let's just be clear here. This is for the, the purpose is the equipping of the saints. And this is for the work of the ministry. So this is in the church. What does, so there are many people here taking Romans. What does Paul do to believers in Romans in reference to the gospel? Does he not proclaim the gospel? Paul is preaching the gospel to believers. So, so if we don't have this in our category, we're missing a fundamental purpose of the gospel. The gospel is not just for conversion. It's also for sanctification and spiritual growth. Do you understand that? We don't think about that. We think it's only for the outside. It's only to go win the lost. And we don't think about how important the gospel is in our daily life. Let me be, give an example. If, you are, if we are not daily given the gospel and the gospel is small in our life, the gospel fundamentally says you, you have forgiveness of your sins in Christ with God the Father. If you cannot see that on a daily basis, it becomes very difficult for you to forgive your neighbor. <laughs> so having a strong view of the gospel will enable you to forgive others around you. And so the gospel has to be proclaimed in our churches. It has to be. It has to be a part of our daily life. Martin Luther said the Christian life is a life of repentance and faith. And I would agree with that. How can you, how can you raise up evangelists to preach the gospel in your church's context? Well, we might even have a class on that. We might have a class on that and really get into specifics of how we can expand our understanding of the gospel apply the gospel in our in our specific context we could have a whole class on that so maybe, so maybe we'll do that in the future um and maybe you can discuss that with you can discuss that with your your church um then we have we have here shepherds literally pastors so a shepherd is a pastor from biblical leadership uh biblical shepherd uh a biblical theology redefining leadership a biblical theology of Shepherd of, 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 of shepherding, literally pastor. And then of course we have teachers. 
Uh, there's also uh, another issues, uh, in-house issues in, within the evangelical, uh, the distinctions of shepherd and teacher. Um, let's say, uh, uh, let's say a person who, uh, you can be a teacher of the word. Uh, a teacher of the word is a distinct office or function as a shepherd. But um, it's quite amazing when I read this also that only at this point, Apostle Paul was trying to unite these two concepts there for designating to only one person. Yep. And that is a person, and that is the eldership or the pastor. Um, a pastor, he is also a, a, a teacher. Uh, it's not a distinction, it's like, for example, you see, uh, your gift is teaching, so you only, uh, you only put into teaching if you are not a pastor. But at this point, Apostle Paul is put really beautifully, uh, shepherd and and teacher. It's not really a distinction, but but really pointing to a, to a one person who function as a as a, as a elder or as a as a pastor of a church. But he is both shepherd and teacher of the word. And I think I think that is consistent with Apostle Paul um, when he also speaks about eldership in Timothy and Titus. Yeah, so 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 specifically here we're looking at we're look we're looking at we're looking at gifts. So most people just don't have one spiritual gift. There's 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 many times there's overlap between the two. I do think that this is speaking to five specific gifts. And and when you actually go to maybe this is what you're saying, um when you go to, to first, uh, first Timothy, an overseer, an elder actually has shepherding. It has, it has shepherding and teaching as, as, as descriptions within, within that. So, so when you're actually looking at like leaders in the church, the, the, the overarching description is uh, elder. That's consistent in the Old Testament and the New Testament, okay? But here, you're looking at specific, unique gifts. So for sure, there's overlap here. There's probably overlap here between these three. So, so, so most pastors have the gift of all three. In this context, though, he's, he's, he's describing specific gifts not not the leaders themselves is that is that making sense sonny what, what what i'm trying to get at oh yes yes that, that yeah. really, uh, what, what i'm trying to say and that's i think that's what you're trying to say as well i'm just i'm just trying to to to, to tweak it to tweak it a bit um and so and so like uh but but that isn't to say in, in a local church you could have someone who is primarily a teacher but isn't the overseer you you can have you can have nuance here. You can have someone who really focuses upon evangelism, that, that is as a gospel proclaimer. He has that gift, but he's not a teacher and he's not a shepherd. And I've actually seen that. I've seen in and maybe this is true as well. You see in in I am more of a teacher, right? So so I'm ordained as a pastor and 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 I preach. I got to preach the first time in two years on Sunday. So I mean, it's, you know, so so I'm also. I'm also involved in, in shepherding and preaching, but, but my gifting is more on the teaching aspect. And so you have different nuances here. The focus in this passage is upon there's unique gifts that Christ has given to, to, bring, to bring the body to full maturity. There can be overlap. There can be overlap. But there also can be distinction. And so in your church, one person could fulfill several of these roles, but each role needs to be utilized. Does that make sense? Each role must be utilized. And so there are some people that are excellent shepherds, but maybe they're not as gifted in, 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 in teaching. And there are some deep theological truths that they struggle with. Um, I'm thinking in TBC, there, there are some people that I'm like, wow, that man, is a, he is a shepherd shepherd, <laughs> or he is a shepherd teacher, or maybe he's really a teacher, right? And so um, um, I, would say that, I would say that looking in our class here, I, I, I hope that I'm not 
stepping on toes and you know, maybe I'm not bringing in pride, but I would say from my looking in our class, attorney Bull Boy Borja is really a teacher. I see that. He's very precise. He's very, uh, he's, he's always on target. Like, is this right? Is this, you know, he's very much like, let's make sure we're on right doctrine. Pastor Henry is really a shepherd and he's always focusing upon the practical. How can we apply this? And so it should not be, oh, Pastor Henry, you're inferior to Bull Boy or, oh, but Pastor Bull Boy, you're inferior to, to Henry. It's they're, they're, they are complementing each other. And so in your church, we should not flatline all of these to say, oh, we all need to be shepherds. We all need to be leaders. We should not be doing that. We should seek to identify the various gifts and let that person flourish in those gifts. Maybe they have two gifts. Let them flourish. Maybe they only have one. Let them flourish. And so, you know, a church that says like, okay, every one of us is a leader. You know, I struggle with that because I just, I don't see that, especially here. You have these, these various gifts that are given to the church and each one who has a specific gift needs to use it. God does not make everyone a leader. Christ does not give the gift of leadership to everyone. If, 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 he, if, if he did, we would be a church of cats and not a church of sheep. <laughs> can you imagine trying to lead cats? It can never be done. It will never be done. Okay? Even dogs. Why did, why did you choose cats? Because you can never lead a cat. They hate, they, <laughs> they will never be led. <laughs> it is like the cat has his own mind. The cat has his own mind. You will never lead a cat. <laughs> Ever. Yeah. And, and, and so so that so that's why when you're looking at the office, I do think I do think it's better to have elder. So we should have a, 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 biblically speaking, the actual office, it really should be elder. And then each elder has specific gifts. So you can have a a, 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 a pastor elder. You could have a teaching elder. You can have a evangelist elder. I'm even thinking of my, my mentor. He is really an evangelist, but he's an elder. He is, a, he is an elder over a church, but his gifting is evangelism. And, and we've even talked about how my gifting is more on teaching. And so we, we really need to, be, to, bring, to bring clarity. And so is it wrong to say pastor? No, that's our context. As long as we understand that the actual office is elder that's elder or overseer to be very clear first timothy three overseer um uh and that's synonymous with elder first peter five one um uh we are we are elders and, and the function is the shepherd okay as long as we're clear on that and, and and i don't think it's wrong to refer to the senior pastor because that's our church tradition but biblically speaking it's really elder that that's really the biblical the biblical um, title, and these are gifts. And so, um, but looking here then, does everyone see how these two gifts are really tapus na? Does everyone see how they're finished? And you can agree or disagree, and I wanna know why from your context. These are, these are completed. With regards to the pro prophets, 13, there's also uh, no one says, or views, uh, uh, two views, I think, uh, in, in terms of that word. Some would say that, you know, especially in Pentecostal uh, point of view, they would always uh, say that there's still a millennial prophets, they would say. Uh, there is still a progress of revelations that God speaks directly to them. However, there are other notions that I, I know of that they, they think of the prophets as equivalent to the proclaimers of the gospel. So this is the issue of foretelling of the gospel uh, and foretelling, foretelling of the gospel, which is uh, for them, the, the, the prophet still now, but he is the foreteller of the, the yes. gospel, which he solely based on the scripture, on the text of the scripture, rather than foretelling uh, a new revelations to them. So, yeah, I would probably say that um, uh, prophets in that sense, you know, the, the, the second the second one um, might be still it still exists today so long as it is 
uh, foretelling, you know, uh, preachers, as long as it is equivalent to the preachers of the gospel. But, but so, the but apostles, so, but, but, no. But so, so Sonny, so, so I don't mean to cut you off. So that that's fine. You, you, you've you been sharing with us the, our, our contemporary context, but my question was in the context. So in this, so in the context of Ephesians, how does Paul either operate from a presupposed structure of what apostles and prophets are or how he sees apostles and prophets? So I'm, I'm asking in the context of Ephesians, how do we define apostles and prophets? I, I guess I'm going to get really specific. So let's put aside the Pentecostal, our contemporary context. How does Paul see these two gifts? And that's going to get us to an exegetical conclusion concerning the gifts. And so maybe it's going to conflict with our understanding. So where in, in Paul, go ahead. Yeah, Paul would mean apostle as a messenger in Romans. Okay. That's what, what the meaning is. Okay, so, 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 in, so in Ephesians, in Ephesians, um, you could say apostle is messenger. But who is the apostle in Ephesians? Paul, yes. Yeah. So, so Paul is one one. Paul is the Paul is the the apostle. And what is he giving in Ephesians? Revelation is he not giving from God? Revelation he's from give, God. Yeah, he's giving scripture, revelation. So he's giving something that none of us could give today. Now, where else is that word mentioned? We already discussed this. Where is the word mentioned, apostle? Where is it mentioned? So right now, what I'm asking you is this is this is exegesis, biblical interpretation 101. We have an issue and we can't just go to like, well, this is the contemporary. I want to take a moderate position. We need to go to the text to see what Paul means. So we're right now we are doing biblical interpretation. So where else does Paul use this word apostle? Someone give me another reference. You can word search it. You can look. Where else does Paul use it? In Romans chapter one, verse. No, in Ephesians, in Ephesians. Ah, sorry, 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 sorry. Chapter two. Okay, chapter Ephesians two. chapter two, verse chapter one. Two, verse one. twenty. Twenty. Someone, go ahead, Henry. Read it. Ephesians chapter two, verse twenty. He said, "Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ, uh, Christ Jesus Himself being the cornerstone." Ephesians 2, 20. Are there apostles and prophets today by this definition? Yes or no? The bar in that context, the, 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 the church is building, it's, it's, it's building up, right? It's, 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 it's building up. The church is building up, right? And we would have to say it's not. It's no longer, you can't keep building the foundation. The foundation doesn't grow, right? So for sure, there's only one Christ. For sure, there's there's only most likely 13 apostles, 99.9%. And then the prophets, looking at these two, I would it would have to be limited, right? It would have to be limited in scope. And then this is Jew and Gentile. Where is another reference? So this is going also into 220. Where is there another reference to apostles? And also prophets. Where is another reference? Three, five. Ephesians 3.5. 5. What does it say? Which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, but it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So in the other references to apostle and prophet, it's special revelation. So why would we why would Paul all of a sudden change his understanding when we come to 411? You would need some very strong exegetical proof to say all of a sudden Paul's concept of apostle and prophet fundamentally changes and applies to everyone in the building when he already has said that it's the foundation. Do you see how it's very Mahirap to come to that conclusion? And Paul is clearly defining. So then the question will be asked, well, then how does apostles and prophets benefit the church today? Because there's no more, right? How does those gifts benefit? And my response is, Henry, you're an engineer. Danny, you're an architect. Does your building still benefit from the foundation today? <laughs> yeah. 
There's only that? one foundation. There's, There's only, one, only foundation. one foundation. Even in a building, you can repair the, uh, the second floor, first floor, but you do not repair the foundation. It's the same foundation. There you go. So we forever, the church forever benefits from the gift, from the gift of apostles and prophets forever in the word of God, in the word of God forever. And so this is debated, but I really want to get, we're looking at the context and I really struggle with, now we can say that in an application sense, what Sonny was saying that we, as, as far as we're proclaiming the gospel, we're proclaiming the word of God, we can carry out the prophetic function. Fair enough, but not in this technical sense. In the technical sense, the prophet has been given new and special revelation. This was hidden from the sons of men in other generations has now been revealed to the holy apostles and prophets by the spirit. It's special revelation. And in the technical sense, this gift is completed with the closing of the canon. I think that is very fair conclusion. I think it's something we need to hold to. And that is not to say that someone in the church, not in this sense, but we could, we could be prophetic in the sense that we're proclaiming the word of God. Fair enough. But in this technical gift sense, taposna, for apostles and prophets. I think that's, I think that's very fair. Um, uh, maybe you would disagree. We can disagree on that. Certainly, but I have, I have in terms of technicalities uh, in these issues in the in Apostle Paul's context, I have this question in mind in terms of the prophets. Was he referring to the Old Testament prophets or was he referring to the prophets in his contemporary? Now, yeah, there's, so there is an evidence what, yeah, there is this, because uh, I, I was bothered this statement when Apostle Paul used the word now, you know, it's very emphatic in, in Greek, it's known, so it's, it's, been, it's not been revealed in the previous generation, which, which is most likely referring to the Old Testament, but yeah. he said has been, has now been revealed. And, uh, and in, in 220, he also referring to the foundation of the church by the apostles on the prophet. And so how does it be connect to the uh, prophetic gift uh, in the Apostle Paul's context in chapter four? So can you- uh, Yeah, you yeah. so, so when uh, it, I, I hope the, the chapter, I believe the chapter, chapter two's video is already posted. In chapter two, it was our interpretation, and, and you can disagree with this, but the apostles and prophets in chapter 2, 20, I interpreted to be the prophets of the Old Testament and the apostles of the New Testament. So the prophets and the apostles form the foundation whose cornerstone is Christ. That's debated, okay? If, if you took, actually, if you took prophets to be New Testament prophets, it would even further solidify the point that the prophet prophetic gift is done away with. Okay. In 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 three five, I agree. So in three five, the apostles and prophets, prophets is most likely New Testament prophets that are given special revelation. So it extends beyond the apostles. And so maybe someone would say I'm inconsistent because the prophets in chapter two should be New Testament prophets as well. Fair enough. But that would only strengthen the case that the the prophets in the New Testament are also this unique gift that's been done away with. So it doesn't actually help, it actually hurts. So um, um, there's, there's precedent in, in, in Romans where the gospel is proclaimed, uh, is, has been promised through the prophets, has now been revealed. And so there's really strong case that the prophets in chapter two, in Paul's mind is Old Testament prophets, in chapter three, it's New Testament prophets. And then in, in, in chapter four, 11, it's New Testament prophets. So that's my, that's my interpretation of that. Um, debated for sure, but either case, it, it does not help the Pentecostal position that says there's still pro prophets in the, in the present day because they're speaking of, if they're gonna be biblical, a totally different type of prophetic function than what's being described here. That that's that's the 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 the, the biggest difficulty. Um, so so I would say you could you could see New Testament or Old Testament. There's debate there, 
but to, but to have this other prophetic type, it, I, I think it, I think it's I think it's difficult. I, I think it's difficult. So yeah, Tim, we can say this is not a function. This is not even an office. It is a grace. It's a gift given to people. It's a gift given to people, and from that true grace, these people will serve the church or will yeah. say proclaim it to the church. Yeah. So it's neither a function, it's neither an office. Yeah, in, in this context, it's a gift. In this office, is a it's gift. A and so the, the, the key here is let, let's highlight this gifts, gave gifts to men, the measure of the gift of Christ. He gave gift. It's the giving of, of, of these gifts. Now, let's be clear though. In other places, apostle is an office. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not disputing the office of apostle, because because it was a specific calling. But I'm I'm saying in this context, it's it's the, it's it's a gift. 